Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Professor Rob Fleming. I'm here with a brief overview and background of the Net Zero First Design Studio, which is running this summer for free starting in the end of May. In 2005, a series of events occurred that fundamentally and radically reshaped our relationship to the natural world. We finally became aware that the decisions that we make as architects, designers, clients, and building professionals have real impacts on the quality of life and even loss of life of human beings. In 2010, the BP oil spill reminded us of that fossil fuels are dangerous. And in 2012, Hurricane Sandy really hit close to home and the term resilience started to gain fashion in the United States. In 2012 was the beginning of a decade of devastating forest fires. And over the years in 2018, we saw the Paradis forest fires. In 2019, the Amazon fires and in 2012, the West Coast fires. All of these in combination with the beginnings of serious social unrest in the United States and the awareness amongst architects, designers, clients, that social equity is not only something to talk about in terms of building design, but imperative that we begin to think about these and implement them into our processes. And finally, COVID-19, what a devastating moment. All of these have set the stage for a real reckoning in terms of how we teach design studio, the things we care about and the things that we focus on. And this video is gonna talk about what this particular design studio is gonna be looking at. So climate change, bias in education, digital learning, emphasis on collaboration and outcomes have demanded new studio methodologies that make sustainability the prime directive the demand for social equity, new ways to connect, better collaboration. And finally, what this course is gonna be working on is evidence-based design. This presentation will show you one possible way that we as architecture professors can really begin to change the way we think and change the way we design. And it starts really by getting into our ethical core. What is happening deep down inside of us? Why are we motivated to do architecture? And if we're not focusing on sustainable design, then what are our motivations and where do our allegiances lie to the future of civilization? So this pyramid of sustainable design hierarchy is really trying to get at the why, the how, and the what. And we've had plenty of work on this. We talk about net zero energy projects all the time, but we don't really talk about the how and why. Why are we doing it and how are we getting there? And it starts really with examining our own self-awareness and understanding our allegiance to self-interest and our other desire to be empathetic, to have long-term thinking, to think about the overall quality of life. And I think this is the better side of architecture. And I think all of us resonate with that. Uh, but in order to do that, we need some new skill sets. And the studio is gonna really work on how do we begin to think about the building scale in relationship to the global scale and how do global, how do global influ influences affect us at the building scale? Furthermore, we've got to think about the future, right? The decisions we make as architects and designers today have huge impacts on the quality of life of future generations. And social equity has to find its way into every design studio. It's no longer a specialized topic that we focus on once in a while. And then there is the empathy across differences. How do we work across different disciplines like engineers, for example, or artists, or how do we work with um, politicians and how do we work with social equity advocates? Central to all of the success of this is really gonna be thinking about design excellence as moving into a subset of a, what we call a QBL definition of sustainable design or quadruple bottom line. So design excellence becomes part of a series of elements that we include into the design studio to create a new model for design education. And it's quite simply called sustainable design. And so there you see how we begin to do that. Uh, the frameworks are so critical for how we organize the mental map of students. Can they think about all of these simultaneously through different lenses to generate a holistic design? So here's the question. What if every design project met net zero performance goals? It seems to me, based on what I've said so far, that every design studio should have this as a prerequisite or something like this. Could be carbon neutrality, could be low embodied energy. It's up to you, I'm choosing to do this. And this particular studio is gonna focus a lot on the processes of what we wanna do here. So order matters. The typical design studio starts with research and analysis. 
does design. And then the last minute, you see this last minute greening and this rationalization of sustainability as included in the project. It hasn't really worked. The buildings that we are designing today are still destroying the environment. So I propose that in this studio, we're gonna do our normal research and analysis. We're gonna reach net zero first with a simple base building. And then we're gonna move into the more predictable, beautiful formalistic design solutions. Uh, so let's take a look at this, not to scale. This is the overall process in detail. I'm gonna zoom in here. And as you'll see, the beginning of the process starts very normally with research, and but you'll also see guiding principles. You don't see the term design concept here because that doesn't come till after midterm. Guiding principles help us form the ethical foundation of a project. We take a deep dive into such simple things like just locating a building can have huge impacts on ecological impact and also the performance of the building. And as we move along, we get into deeper and deeper complexity, passive design, we get into building envelope, and finally, we get into active systems, and in particular, PV array sizing, which will allow us to get to net zero energy. And then we move into the formal design process that is most recognizable. I'm hoping that if we have the time this semester, we'll get into carbon footprints of materials and begin to try to understand that as well. All right, furthermore, let's dig a little deeper. We're gonna be using an emergent design process. And the idea here is that design bubbles up from the ground. It does not come in from the top. And the analysis and research forms the foundation upon which we make decisions. Then we move up into preliminary design and we definitely spend a lot of time looking at different options as we move through. We do a lot of evidence gathering and building simulation and then we get into synthesis and we repeat this over and over again until we get to midterm and we've reached a net zero energy performance building. From there, we can begin to expand out again uh, and think about the overall design synthesis. Key to this is really understanding how to isolate learning objectives at each point along the way so the students are not overwhelmed with what it is they're trying to learn, but at the end, coming back with design accountability. Not did the students do a good building, but were the students accountable to the own goals and guiding principles that they set early on in the process. And to me, that's how we can begin to grade students to understand their performance. What does the work look like? I mean, I, I still think students can get to beautiful work. This has been at Sony's work last semester, but what was really interesting was he was held accountable or he held himself accountable to different metrics. And you'll see that his SDA was pretty low. And he would be the first to tell you that if he had to have more time, he would have probably developed that further. Further, Schritzer was very interested in ecological integration and spent a lot of time removing paving removing impervious services and putting in habitat spaces for her project. And Marzea was very interested in water and developed a living machine in her project to try to get to net zero water. And Duani was really interested in how the architectural form related to the performance of the building and how we could get to very, very ambitious EUI levels before PV. Uh, Suvitha was really interested in Ladybug and Grasshopper and spent a lot of time using the, the tools there, working with Junky Vias to get to some really dynamic and beautiful energy performance. And finally, Ahmed Messali did a project that was exploring the impact of water and the rise of water, but also still trying to get to some very ambitious numbers. And then finally, Kajal also spent a lot of time on water, but really was interested in how to poetically bring photovoltaic into the fold so that it becomes a part of the expression of the project. So that is a really brief overview. And yes, it was heavy handed. And yes, I'm very opinionated. And if you like that kind of teaching, maybe you'll enjoy this course. We're starting on May 23rd. We're ending on August 15th. This is the only time that I plan to offer this course for free. College credit is not available, but if you do apply to Jefferson and get accepted, some scholarships will be available for you. And then there is prize money for students who enter and finish the entire course. So I'm very excited to working with you uh, this, this coming summer. If you have questions, you can go to this website that's shown here and there all of your questions will be answered. And with that, I'm gonna end this video and say, thanks for listening. <laughs>